Okay, thank you everyone very much for coming. It is a great pleasure to be sharing this event and this exhibition uh, at the Etherton Gallery with my very good friend, Keith Carter. Um, I'm going to put a slide on of Keith that I love here. Um, Keith and I met in Texas in uh, the 90s, back when I was completely unknown and I was teaching at the University of Texas. And I was very moved by his work. In fact, I thought he was just the greatest photographer in Texas, if not the world, which is the same thing if you're a Texan. Um, <laughs> So I used, to, I used to actually show up at his book signings and lurk around, plucking up the courage to speak to him. And I finally did. Um, I became sort of a stalker fan. I eventually shyly gave him a, a gift, a, a print I'd done, and I asked whether he'd come and see uh, my very first solo show in Austin. And he liked the work enough, and he started mentioning me to some of the powerful people in the photographic circles in Texas. And I believe he played a, a, a role in getting my work noticed. And so after that, very good things started to happen, and my career took off. And in fact, I've done so well that um, Keith is now my stalker fan, wouldn't you say? <laughs> <laughs> so this is where I am originally from in the world. Um, I apologize to any Tasmanians in the audience. Um, there's a whole other state down there, by the way, an island state. Um, and among my other right greatest influences that I had this eccentric family of animal rescue people. This is my aunt back in the 50s with what we call a possum, an Australian ringtail marsupial possum that she rescued with many, many, many other creatures. And um, that one's <laughs> not quite true. <laughs> and then, so I, that's not true either, except I did, ran away to art school, which amounts to the same thing. Um, <laughs> I studied painting and printmaking and I gradually fell in love with photography just when it was coming into its own as a medium. I've always combined um, paint and photos and I don't have time to talk about that now because this is a short presentation. I just want to say that as an artist, by definition, my work is an attempt to convey what I care most deeply about. And at the top of that list is a fascination with the natural world. I tend to work in these very big series um, that are endless and overlapping and I'm going to just quickly show you now some of those things before I get to the current work. So I've got like 200 slides, which is, um, I'm just going to go through them really fast. So pay attention, don't blink. <laughs> Keith's only got 50, so I win that one. <laughs> so I'm best known for this uh, large body of hand-colored work called Small Deaths, which are large-scale portraits of uh, small dead animals, mostly birds, that I've been making for about 20 years. Uh, this is the work that Keith actually originally saw. Um, they're memorials uh, to commemorate particular little lives obviously to express my sorrow and regret and as a gesture towards all the little creatures that, uh, whose lives and deaths happen around us without notice. I make them big, I make them human scale um, so they have a real presence and, I get, and so I can get to know them and I colour them in so I get to, to know them very well intimately, record every feather and all the exquisite detail before their bodies are gone. So this is like mortuary photography. There's actually about 250 in the series now um, so I'm known officially as the dead bird lady. <laughs> Soon to become the old cat lady. <laughs> An old cat lady. All right, so I'm, just, I'm sorry about the little strips of white. I didn't do a very good job at editing these things. Anyway, these are in a book, by the way. These are my first book called Small Deaths, published by the University of Texas Press. Um, by the Whitliff series, part of the Whitliff series. I think I'm nearly coming to the end of that one. So for me, the making images of things from the natural world is an extension of being fascinated, touched, intrigued by all life. I've written the process of seeing, recording, interpreting transforms me. It's how I express love and wonder, how I connect myself to all living things. So again, this is a different series entirely, but uh, they're all about the same thing. These are little, all the rodents that drowned in the pool one summer that I, I decided to, uh, to let party down in a drawer. Again, different, this is a bird from Australia, a galah, just a, a backyard bird, a cockatoo. Collection of curly eucalypt, oh, not yet, wait. Collection of curly eucalyptus leaves, collection of skulls, so I collect things, obviously, pick them up and bring them home and make photographs of them. Most recently, you've heard of snakes on a plane, snakes on lace. 
dead, all dead, of course. Then there's major collections of seed pods and then a huge collection of potted cacti. And again, I, I'm not going to talk about these because I just want to get to the current work. Uh, this was my German Expressionist work, <laughs> <laughs> which was all about color and, mo and emotion and all sorts of things. And these little, little plants having their own character. And as I said, because um, I've lived in the Sonoran Desert for so long, I've, I love uh, everything about it and I've made a lot of images of the f all the flora and the fauna, including a set of uh, portraits of tumbleweeds And or, I was lucky enough, to, again, to have the uh, Whitliff collection with University Press publish uh, this book, Painted Light, uh, which contains all the very hand-coloured work that I've done uh, in the past 30 years. Uh, which brings me then to the next, more recent body of work, uh, which was called La Sombres, The Shadows, and their photograms. And um, these... So this is, I basically, I collect, I collect up dead animals. Sometimes they've been, um, you know, hit, hit their roadkill. Um, and it's a process where, it's a cameraless process uh, where images are made by literally pa placing them down on uh, light sensitive paper and exposing them to light. So here is a, the, my dark room with a jackrabbit lying on the, the baseboard here before I've put the light underneath, obviously, and shut the door. And then what happens is, um, I get this. So they become these ghostly shadows of, of themselves. Um, and here we are, and this is my assistant over here in the green t-shirt, and she's sitting over there. Is she? No, there she is. Okay. <laughs> my friend and my assistant who has helped me again for the last 15 years that I've lived here. This is us washing prints um, because some of them are very, very big. Um, and we have to wash them outside in these, horse, these troughs that are horse, wa horse water are troughs. Um, and then I take them inside and let the cat sleep on them for a while. <laughs> Always good. And then I actually, I'm, I, then I actually rub um, paint on top of them to make them uh, more golden. So um, I'll just show you some of these quickly. Uh, I've done everything from a bald eagle, which was about six feet across, um, that was commissioned by Harper's Magazine uh, right through to tiny things like scorpions and then everything in between. Uh, again, mostly desert creatures. So you will understand what a photogram is. Did I explain that well enough? Lots and lots of birds. And this one is... Um, I emptied out my light sconces that <laughs> <laughs> and got some tweezers and arranged them nicely around the spider. Bull snake, rat snake, I'm sorry. Right. Jacaranda leaf. And again, there's hundreds of these, obviously. Then I go off to the um, Tohono Chul Park and steal leaves. See, I'm already at slide 74. I told you I could do it. <laughs> and as you can notice, the light actually because there are things that are, uh, that are semi-opaque, like the wings of bats or the feathers of birds, and the light goes through those, so you get this wonderful three-dimensional effect happening. And then these are also published um, in a book, UT Press, Whitliffe Collection book. Um, and again, that's the Cody that I showed you in the beginning. And then I, when I show these, this was a show at Etherton a few years ago, I go out and find... Um, vintage frames and I put them all shapes and sizes in these frames and hang them on mass salon style um, and then I had recently had a show of this work at the Tucson Art Museum uh, for an exhibition that was called Grasslands earlier last year 
So um, I did it again. See, the biggest thing I've ever done is that, well, the biggest thing I did was the bald eagle, but there's a deer in here in the middle of that, that one. And then on the other wall, I had all the tiny ones right down to little bees and, and bugs. Okay, so the next set of work uh, was done when I put a, a infrared motion, motion sensing camera in the desert outside of our house uh, where we live out on the northwest side and we have desert um, right in front of us. And so what happens is these creatures walk by and they take their own picture basically because they've uh, turned the camera on. So you just go get the chip out of the camera and there are thousands and thousands of pictures of um, rabbits and birds and stuff and then occasionally there's something like a bobcat or this amazing one which is uh, a javelina with babies. Now the eyes, because it's infrared at night, um, the, the, the light, the infrared uh, makes the retina of everything glow like that. So the glowing eye is all about the infrared photography. And here you see this is a, a poor little fox who's blind, blind in one eye. So the camera, because it makes the tiniest little noise when it's set off, and because it has this tiny little red light, often the creatures who are walking by notice and stop and walk towards it. So you often get these wonderful images that, where they're walking towards it. This is a daytime one again. This is a jackrabbit um, bouncing by at dawn. This is a Cody. It's a little owl, a little screech owl. So I blew these up very big. Uh, most of them are sort of 40 by 60-ish size. Uh, and then I actually work back into them because I, that's what I do. I can't help myself. So Mockingbird. More Cody's. Pack rats. <laughs> and this one, uh, you get these wonderful ones that I don't end up blowing up, but they're really amazing. This is a rat running by. <laughs> and so this is what the raw file looks like. Um, this is the brand name of the camera underneath, Reconyx Hyperfire, and then the, the, the stuff here is the details about exactly when and what time and what temperature. It's a good one with young deer. This is actually a different make of camera, but this is the... Does everyone know Monty Python's Holy Grail? <laughs> and do you remember there was that rabbit that was the killer rabbit? This is... <laughs> Now, I'm just going to show you this sequence because often, because the camera is, is set to go off every three seconds when there is movement in front of it, you know, you see this sort of stop frame um, stuff happening. So here is a javelina who is bristling because, and then he's deciding to charge the camera <laughs> and then he runs off and then he just looks straight in the camera. <laughs> so. And then in this one, this is a bobcat who's walked by the camera. Here he goes turns around, here's the camera, looks at it, turns around, oops, walks up and pees on it. <laughs> so, so it's kind of fun just seeing this whole thing going on uh, in your absence. And then, as you can see, I, I've shown these at the Temple Gallery and uh, this is to show you the scale of them. I call them creatures of light and darkness. So then we took the camera to Australia, and this is a, and I got kangaroos. And also, what happened was I um, I wanted there were these native black swans down on the coast uh, near where I live, and um, I could never get close enough to them because they're wild and they just flew away. I'd ru I'd sneak down to try and get pictures of them and they'd always fly off. This is the camera recording them flying off. But eventually, I left it there long enough that I got these beautiful pictures where they stood around uh, at dusk. And in fact, I think I've got a sequence here or not. They do this weird gesturing thing. I think it's aggressive, but they do this snaking of their neck thing at each other. And um, anyway, they started appearing and so I got a couple of beautiful ones, this one I think in particular. So what I've done is I've taken all the colour out and I've made them a tone. And, and, uh, so this, and this one is in, these, these last two are in the Etherton exhibition at the moment. This one I, I've blown up very big also because I like it so much. And again, I go back and paint in it. Um, just to bore you for a minute, does anyone know what the black swan theory is? Anyone heard of the black swan theory? Yes? 
some people? An event which is, comes as a surprise, a major event? Um, what I'm going to tell you is that, uh, this is just a coincidence, of course, because I have the black swan picture, but it derives from the whole notion that in, the, uh, in England in the 1600s, um, black swans were proposed, were presumed not to exist because there were only white swans in the old world. So that there was, the black swan became a metaphor for something um, that, that is an analogy to the fragility of a system of thought, the idea that if a black swan actually exists, then there is this whole system of thought, um, a set of conclusions potentially undone. Um, anyway, anyway, this is because, as I said, the black swans, uh, they, they didn't believe existed. They were an impossibility, basically. Um, so in 16th century, oh, then what happened was the Dutch went out and to the West Indies and then discovered Australia and started mapping the coast of Australia in the mid-1600s. And they found black swans, these very black swans I've just shown you. So the whole notion of a black swan theory became a whole other thing, but it was more about something that seems improbable um, but actually does happen. So um, I'm going to now then tell you about this current work um, because I've had my own black swan event which is something uh, in brief, brief I'll just say to be perfectly honest um, this hugely significant thing recently happened to me someone I've been with for 33 years and loved deeply didn't apparently feel the same way and consequently is gone from my life which was a disturbing fact that has called into question who I am what any of us can ever trust what is important in life um, and so, again, it, this is a shocking and unexpected, unpredictable event, which is the black swan event. Um, and it made me whether I could actually ever make art again, actually. It seemed like life truly had no meaning. However, I've never not made art. It's what I do. It's the only thing I know how to do. So I started to wonder whether it was possible to convey sadness and loss metaphorically, whether having a broken heart could be somehow translated visually, like it obviously can be in music and literature, and whether it could be beautiful. So this series is called Out of Darkness, and it's pictures of oceans and clouds and storms and moons and ravens, beautiful things that have always been symbols, always things that I've liked, wanted to photograph, but now they've become metaphors for sadness and despair, Loneliness, pain, contemplation of a whole life of unrequited love. I just was reading, uh, someone wrote this, there's a deep cultural presumption that creating something out of grief somehow makes it all even out in the end, that your deepest call is to transform your grief into a work of art that touches others, that when you do that, when you turn to creative expression in the depths of pain, you are in fact healing your grief. Creativity is a way to transform pain. The results of your creativity, if they're good, can help others transform their pain. But the truth is there is no fair trade. Whatever you might create in your pain, out of your pain, no matter how beautiful or useful it might be, it never erases your loss. It will never make it okay in the end. Pain is not redeemed by art. So, obviously, there's these... I have all these you know, in great influences in, of life. I've lived by the sea my whole life and I've photographed the ocean in, in its various moods and uh, loved uh, Gerhard Richter's ocean paintings and uh, Sugimoto, Sugimoto's uh, sea, I, sea images. Um, this is my hopeful picture. <laughs> <laughs> also, of course, uh, uh, Gerhard Richter did clouds, cloud paintings, and there's a pa pairing here of a white cloud and a dark cloud. And then I've always, I've, I love clouds, and I always dash out and photograph clouds, and of course we just had the monsoon season, so there's plenty of them around to do. Uh, giant billowing clouds, and then there's rainstorms. This, this was made on, our, on a trip out to 
Santa Fe in New Mexico of a rainstorm. That's Mount Etna, actually. So Mount Etna is an active volcano in Sicily, and it smokes away, and it forms clouds above it. So again, a whole, whole set of clouds, different clouds, different kinds of clouds. You've all seen these clouds. Uh, they're called mamatus clouds, and they're, uh, they're, uh, they're usually storm before a storm. Here's another hopeful one. So these, are, these have been lightly hand-colored, and they've been, uh, they've been manipulated in, in Photoshop. So, OK, so this is the last bit. How am I going for time? Am I right? OK. So um, planetary scientists are pretty sure that four million years ago, the Earth collided with a giant object. This is not my picture, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> And a big chunk of Earth, a big chunk of the Earth was actually smashed off. And all the pieces and all the rubble that got smashed off coalesced into our moon. So our moon used to be part of the Earth. And the hole that was left in the Earth after this giant collision is what the Pacific Ocean is now. The Pacific Ocean is the wound. It's the scar left by the absence of the moon. So I did a whole series of moon pictures because I just am fascinated by the idea. This is obviously an eclipse. I'll just go through these. There are 15 moons uh, here from various times and places. And I started, obviously the moon has always been a symbol for many, many things, including love and loss. In multiple mythologies, it's believed to have uh, a powerful effect on human behavior, including insanity, lunacy. Um, then there's the whole werewolf thing. <laughs> um, it can transform you. Uh, and there's so much has been written about the moon. Uh, Mark Twain said, everyone is a moon and has a dark side, which he never shows to anyone. The moon is a loyal companion. It never leaves. It's always there, waiting steadfast, knowing us in our light and dark moments, changing uh, forever just as we do. Every day is a different version of itself, sometimes weak and wan, sometimes strong and full of light. The moon understands what it means to be human uncertain, alone, created by Im imperfections. This one was, that last one was taken through a telescope, obviously. Um, the famous Japanese author Murakami wrote, the moon has been observing the Earth close up longer than anyone. It must have witnessed all of the phenomenon occurring and all of the acts carried out on this, on this Earth. But the moon remained silent. It told no stories. All it did was embrace the heavy past with a cool, measured detachment. On the moon, there is neither air nor wind. Its vacuum was perfect for preserving memories unscathed. No one could unlock the heart of the moon. This one I took back in 1980-something or other. And then I, a few weeks ago, I was up in, uh, saw the Niagara Falls for the first time in my life. And there was a full moon, one of the super moons over Niagara. Oh, did I show that one already? Sorry. Um, so there is, here's, an, here's one of a tree reaching for the moon. And this is at the Grand Canyon um, a few years ago. Apparently, you can see the Grand Canyon from the moon. Isn't that amazing? So that's really it. I've just shown you all the work that's in Terry Etherton's show. Not all of it, actually. Um, because, in fact, I have up at the moment uh, in the Etherton Gallery <laughs> 132 pieces, <laughs> uh, which he told me was a record for any one living artist and um, probably dead artist too. But he's given me a trophy, and I won't tell you what it says <laughs> on the trophy. <laughs> Shall I say, or is it too awful? It says, Wall Whore. <laughs> Anyway, that's it. I'm going to leave you with this image I made the other day uh, of a rainbow at sunset. Uh, this is two images that I've pasted together in the miracle of which is Photoshop. So that's all for me. Thanks. <laughs>